the midst, man, I was facing my own doubts and defeat. That's when the Lord told me to jump to my feet. Cause I had blessings that were right in my reach. I had to usher in his presence of peace. I almost forgot about the promises he promised. He Thank you for tuning into the Red Zone. You listen to Underground Railroad with your host, Sam and Abraham. And our motto is to reach the one person that no one else can. We come from two very different backgrounds, and we've met in the same location, serving life sentence in the penitentiary. never knew that this would happen, that we'd end up on a podcast and speaking life into people. Our first shows will be interviews that start by saying this question in front of our guests and letting them share their stories with us. The scenario set before us today is that there are all these people who go through life feeling that not only is everyone against them and can't be trusted, but God, too, is against them and can't be trusted. It's hard to imagine going through life believing that the all-powerful God is against you, that everything you learned about God from Sunday school and your grandma isn't so easily believed. Are we not taught that God is good, all-powerful, knowing the end from the beginning? Yeah, he doesn't seem to intervene as you expected. As you see it, he saw it coming and just watched. It's hard to say that you're all-powerful and good and just turns your head when I need you the most. Unless something else is meant by all-powerful, all-knowing, and good, is it not fair to be at the very least disappointed in God? Our guests will answer, answer the question of what happened that caused you to lose faith or doubt God's goodness. What is your rationale for believing God is good in light of your life's experience? And what would you say to the person who shares the same life experience as you? Moving forward, Abraham will take the mic and tell you where his heart's at in this issue. So thank you for tuning into the Red Zone. You listen to the Underground Railroad with your host, Samuel and Abraham. Uh, today, uh, we are talking about the goodness of God in our life experiences. Uh, we go through life thinking that um, everyone is against us, not just everyone, but God himself. Things happen in life, in our lives, bad experiences that make us question who God is. If he's all powerful, all knowing, all seeing and everywhere at all times, then why does he allow certain things to happen to our lives? And so we seek to see the goodness in God out of everything that happens and transpires in our life. See him for who he truly is, despite what comes our way. So, my first question for Sam, what happened to you that caused you to doubt the goodness of God? Or not even believe that he's good? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good question, Abe. Uh, I can't say that I'm super stoked about really answering this question, to be honest with you, man, but uh, I know that we're asking other people these questions. I know you always told me, you said, Sam, we have to be transparent and never ask somebody to do something that you ain't willing to do yourself. And so because I believe in that, I definitely will. So my, uh, man, it's the most glimpse of like memories, but I remember a time when like I was a genuinely loving person. It's maybe five and a half, six, maybe. And just, I remember just this one day where it was just like, I'm going and, I go in the woods, and all I know is that everything changed the moment I walked out of there. It wasn't some major abuse or anything like that, but it was a trust, and it was an abuse that took place. And I just remember walking away, and I was just like, that didn't happen, that didn't happen, that didn't happen. And then someone was like, dude, you can't even lie to yourself. And it was like on a sunny day, like it just started raining. You know what I mean? And it was weird because it was so impactful and so instant. It was like literally from that moment forward, like, dude, it was just nightmares, just tormenting nightmares. Like every morning when I was like trying to wake up, it was just like someone was trying to try and take my breath away. Like I'm fighting out of my dreams. I'm having brutal nightmares. I became extremely sensitive, like in the sense of uh, like anybody that did anything wrong to me, it could be something small. It could be like my dad disciplining me, like on the most normal human level. I took that as like, you hate my guts. And I just spent my whole life just sitting around like, everybody hates me. Nobody wants me. I became extremely suicidal. I remember just sitting in the woods with these knives and just like, I just want to end it. But I just knew that like, I'm going to go to hell. And it was just this, this primal fear of like, this unknown place that I hear about that I don't want to go. And uh, 
next thing you know, I'm nine years old, man. I've been, I've just been tormented all this time. And my dad's like, Hey dude, we're going to this new church. And it's like, Oh man, this is great. I mean, these just the coolest people in the world. It was like a whole new family. And it's like, these feelings have just subsided. You know what I mean? Like I'm not suicidal. I feel a lot of peace. And a lot of it revolves around, I met this person, this youth pastor, and he was like a father figure to me. He was like God. He was like everything to me. And, and I just remember like, as the years go by, you know what I mean? And, uh, everything changed. And this person that was once like a father figure, uh, it was no longer that to me anymore at all. And I remember coming home from school and my parents normally they're just not sitting together right there and looking crazy. Yeah. It was at this point that like I had just like everything from the past just came back into just one moment and I just cracked. And it was really in this, uh, this breaking time in my life that I just remember looking over the highway and just, it was the first time that I'd ever like questioned God in that sense. But, uh, that's, that's when I asked that question, like, I really thought deeply about his power. I knew his power was real. It was obvious to me, but that was the moment where like I made a judgment on his goodness and I judged him to be evil. And, uh, that's where it landed this this question where it just it, it hit home and and uh it, it was the worst judgment I ever made in my life so what is your rationale for believing that God is good in light of the present circumstances of your life yeah i uh on this one man I actually wrote something out and so I might rehash a little bit of what I said but uh it, it was the only way I could really have clarity of thought so uh, I'm gonna just I'm gonna just start by reading it and uh, and I'll be better able to just describe where I'm at and uh, so this question plagued me at, at a young age and my conclusion was that because he didn't stop the abuse when it was in his power to do so that he was just as guilty as the abuser so it's not my fault for how I cope with past experiences therefore my response to the past is it's his fault you can imagine the direction my life went after alienating the only one who could and would help. But you never ask the one to help you who you believe put you in the situation you're in in the first place. It wasn't until I realized how many times God spared my life and protected me while in prison. And that's when I came to see that, dude, he's got his hand on me. And that was huge in terms of just hope for my life. Uh, it was very stressful believing that the only person you count on is yourself. And as I laid in my cell, I thought about what life for me would look like without any of the evil. And it looked nice, but it was missing something. It was missing someone. And I wouldn't have any need for God, at least that's what I would think. And I remember reading a commentary by Albert Barnes, and, uh, and he says, The well will never know the beauty of medicine or the person who administers it. And the fat and the well-fed will never appreciate the farmer. And, uh had he not allowed evil in my life, I may never know how evil evil is and run from it. I may never pray to God to overcome it. What brought me to my knees brought me to my God. But that doesn't answer why he allowed the evil to happen, at least not yet. But it does lead you to the God of the Bible, and he does speak on the issue of evil. But before that, I want to use a moment to exonerate God, if, if I can use such a term. It's not that he needs it, but just to show my conclusion on the matter and uh, and about him being blamed for evil of men. Uh, that's what I had done. And uh, so when you have an ancient city, you would have watchmen on the wall who would let the people know danger was coming by blowing a trumpet. If they saw an enemy coming and did not warn the people, they were guilty for whatever happened to the people in the city that they were watching. There's an Old Testament prophet who was told that if he had not warned the people, God would hold him responsible for their demise. So I must follow God's logic. Once you warn a person of the consequences of their actions and the danger, you transfer responsibility to that person. The second God warned Adam and Eve of the consequences of eating from the tree, he is no longer liable. God said that if they ate, they would die, and they did, and they brought all of their children with them. If God was not good, he would have never warned them. 
let's say your dad came home with a brand new Chevy truck and he told you it's yours. Enjoy it, but change the oil and take it into the dealership for regular checkups. And you agree. You grab the keys, and before you go out the door, he says, if you don't do what I say, the truck will be broken. You say, sure thing, and you ride that truck hard and put it away wet. You never change the oil and never get a checkup. A couple of years later, you're in the middle of nowhere in Montana, and you break down. Is that really your dad's fault, or is it yours? In the same way, Adam was warned. Did he see that the death meant him having to bury his son who was murdered by his other son? Adam never imagined the hell of death he let loose how sin produced death, how Cain killed Abel, and how we ourselves know the right thing to do and oftentimes don't do it. Uh, we like to distance ourselves uh, from our brothers, claim that we're better than God. And, but if you take a minute and really look within, you will find you are very much like this man, Adam, who knew it was wrong to eat but did it anyway, and Eve, who was deceived by its looks. It's very hard to say, why am I punished for what Adam did when in your heart you know that apples don't fall far from the tree. What would you say to someone who you find is going through the same circumstances that you went through that pushed you to these questions now that you're on the other side? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, the first thing is just really understand that God is for you, like really find that that, that logic of it. Dude, this is not God's fault. Uh, there's evil men in this world, and they do evil things. Uh, the second, uh, it's, I, I don't want to say it's equal to the first, but, man, it's forgive. I remember there was this guy named Brian Zetterberg, and uh, he was really there for me right off the gate to, to, like, really speak of, like, what's most important in that. He said, Sam, you have absolutely got to forgive and, and then pray blessing, and that was really hard for me to accept. And I didn't accept it. I, I didn't do that. It wasn't until later on in my life, way after I'd been incarcerated, that I I really forgave and then prayed blessings. It, it, it can be to the point to where you can't even say the person's name and you have to force yourself to say the name and then to pray a blessing upon that person. It, it, it was brutal, uh, but and it took a lot of time. And, yeah, I didn't believe it when I first said it. Like, I wasn't sitting there like... I really believe this prayer, and I really want these great things to happen to this person. But my heart did change uh, through just, in a sense, forcing a prayer. Um, the the third thing is uh, you're always going to ask the question of why me. Like, that's just a typical thing for anybody that's gone through this. And said, dude, like, how did how did I get chosen out of all these people? Like, like what is it about me? Is there something wrong with me? And... There's one thing that I could say, and this isn't going to fit everybody, uh, but for me, because I was so hungry for love, it really like set me up for a failure. And in Proverbs 27, verse 7, it says, One who is full of loathes honey, but to one who is hungry, everything bitter is sweet. And it, it just means that your own, your own hunger for, for something can really set you up for really bad things. It's, it's no different than maybe... Uh, Oh, somebody needing protection, needing food, needing, needing any other just basic human need. You know, they, they sometimes put themselves in just a really bad spot. And uh, it could be a girl hooked up with a guy. This is like, she's like, dude, I need a place to get out of, you know, it's horrible weather outside. I just, I need a place to stay, da, 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 da. And they, they lock themselves in with a dude that's just no good. And uh, it, it's that same thing as just, you know, just, you needed something, don't beat yourself up for it because you wanted somebody to love you. Like, that's not wrong. It's, it, it's okay. And, uh, and the other thing, it's, uh, and I never, I don't think I even mentioned this story, but when it, everything had happened and I'm sitting around and having to talk with like all these cops and all these agents, I had to go downstairs in this room and there was this like child psychiatrist or therapist. I don't even know what it, it, what she was. I just remember, I don't even remember talking to her. She just looked at me like knowing the situation. She just looked over and she like had this crazy look in her eyes and she was just like, dude, you're just going to become like him. And she was just pissed. And it's like, I didn't even talk to this lady. And what she's referring to in a lot of people in our culture, it's called the bite of the vampire. And, uh, and that's the theory that like, if you've been bitten, you'll bite too. And Dude, it was really something that was probably one of the most like brutal things that anybody said to me. Because it's like I lived in fear of like, dude, I could become just like this person, and it was it just haunted me. It, it gave me like fear of myself. 
and uh, it's something that stuck with me for a long time. And then it wasn't really until maybe like, I don't know, maybe three years ago, I was trying to work on my case, and there's this guy by the name of Dr. John Conti, and I, I'd gotten a hold of him, and it, he interviewed me when I was a kid, and uh, I was able to get a hold of him, and, and he happened to remember me, and uh, I asked him about it. I said, is this true? And he said, absolutely not. He said it's, it was a theory that was put out, and uh, there's no truth to it at all. And and it helped a lot because this guy is the authority on the issue of abuse. And uh, so it was one of those things that uh, he was able to just bring a lot of closure in my life. And uh, and I'm very thankful for that man and, uh, and just uh, him reaching out and it just feeling something and uh, letting me know that something wasn't true because, you know, a lie will destroy you. And uh, and the last thing, I'll just say that God not only can, but he will turn it for good. And uh, even though you hate these things that happened and uh, just trust that one day you're going to be able to help somebody and be able to save a life. And I think if you can hold out that hope just that your story is going to help somebody else out, it can help you get out of your own circumstances. And, uh, and that's that's probably the most important thing but uh yeah that's that's kind of that's kind of where i'm at you know i just i appreciate y'all listening to my story uh uh and uh, uh hopefully uh this will shed some light and and help somebody so so abraham we've been talking about the goodness of god and 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 the things that have you know happened that the, has caused us to question that so the, we're going to pass the baton to you so to speak and man I'm just curious what happened that has caused you to lose faith in God's goodness or just caused you to doubt it? Uh, I, I would have to go back uh, when I was really young. Um, growing up, I had a sense of who, who God is. You know, family had me going in and out of churches, you know. Uh, so just knowing, who, knowing about him, you know, I always knew about him. Um, but it didn't, he didn't measure up to my, to where I live. See, I, I'm from the hood, you know, and I, I, you know, hood, you know, the hood teaches something totally different with the kingdom of God act that teaches, you know? Uh, so in my neighborhood, you know, you see drugs, gangs, and just, just about everything, you know? Uh, and then just being to grow up in the house, house, household I grew up in, um, you know, uh, to max of violence, all these things, and 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 you know, it it didn't quite measure up what they what they was preaching inside the church. Uh, where they preached in the church it sounded good, but where I was living was totally opposite what they preached. Especially when it come to some man named Jesus, you know. So it really didn't measure up to me. Um, but uh, and so that's always in doubt. At the end of the day, you know what I'm saying? I just live my living situation, how I grew up and how things came to be. But then when I got full fledged into the game, uh, you know, that was something totally different also because like it was something totally something totally different for real. Uh, and I'm like, man, it, it's like we say, if this if he's God, if he's real, then why all this crap's happening? Why all this stuff is going on, right? Are you serious, right? How can a living God just do this, right? And so uh, I'm a fast forward. That's that's like from the age like nine, maybe to thirteen, maybe all this stuff was going on, right? And by age fourteen, fifteen, I was full fledged in the gangs, gang life like that. I was living, you know, good do do hood things. That's how I grew up. And so uh, by the age seventeen, that hood stuff caught up with me and my family. My brother got killed, right? He got killed, and uh, and that's the first time I like. Forget God. He ain't no, you know what I'm saying? He took my bro from me. You know what I'm saying? He ain't real, you know. Um, and everything they talked about, it was all it didn't measure up to nothing. It's a bunch of bull crap. And so uh just just you know, uh I don't know, man, just stuck. I I just couldn't understand. I couldn't put I can't really put in words right now into and kind of explain how deeply I feel, how much I read, how much I hated. Uh, just the simple fact that, hey, if it is a God, then why, you know? Uh, and so that's something that really happened, man. I I, I ended up going to prison. 
like 17 days after my brother got killed. You know, I I, I ended up catching the case myself uh, for a long time, you know. And um, and so during my stint in prison for my first 15 years, uh, you know, uh, I ain't gonna lie, I went in and outside of church, and but I had just so just just deep seated hate of bitterness and deep within, like man, I just couldn't shake the fact of how in the world he let all this stuff happen. How in the world do I get to the point where I'm at today, man? To you know what I'm saying. My family, um, where I'm at, my bro, it's just like, it's just like, it just, it ate me up, man. It ate me up deep inside, man. And uh, I just feel bitterness. And so for me, uh, really growing up, man, seeing the stuff I see in my neighborhood, my community, I didn't lose my brother. Uh, that was a real, a real deep, 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 deep uh, core issue with me, man. Who I really question about who God is, his goodness, his love, his provisions, his grace, his mercy. I'm like, man, this dude don't even exist, man. If he does exist, like he don't care about the hood. You know, so that's kind of how I grew up, man. You know, that's where my my experience come in when it comes to questioning, was God really good? Was he really real? And so now at this point in your life, after you've gone through all those things, and especially with your brother dying and uh, now, like, what's your rationale for believing that God is good in, in light of what you've gone through? Like, what's caused that change? So, um, like I said, I was, in, I was in prison for a minute, man. I did my first 15 years. And um, I pretty much lived like I lived on the street, man. You know what I'm saying? Like I said, hood do, do hood things, man. And, and um, but I had an awakening. I seen my first parole board, man. and and you know, I you know, I played the game, played the role. I think everybody's cool. They're gonna let me out. Well, you know, I you know, you know, you know, you try to uh, play the game, and and so I ended up sitting, sitting in front of the pro board man, and dude tell me he, he's he's very um, what was his words? He is very impressed about how I came in and worked on myself, right? He's like, man, he said, man. If you don't get parole, the only reason why you don't get parole because we feel like you ain't did enough time, right? So you gotta remember, I caught my case. And I was like seventeen years old, or like a month shy of my eighteenth birthday, and so fifteen years in—that's like thirty-two years. I'm like, that's a long time for a young man. So when he tell me, you know, I'm like fifteen years. Old, seven, oh, that's enough time, right? But when he say, you know, if you don't get parole because we feel like you ain't did enough time, so when I get my results back, you know, they pass me five years. And when they passed me five years, man, it's like everything came up again, right? Uh, everything, like uh, the bitterness, the hatred, like, you know what I'm saying? I questioned, you know, at that time I was going out of church, but I think like, I go to church, you know, maybe I get some love, you know, you find, you know, it is the gene and bottles type of thing. So I like, you know, I'm like, man, dude, you ain't real, man. I've been doing this. I've been doing that. And then, uh, you know, just I'm talking about the bitterness, the hate. And then I topple that, my own insecurity and fears, like me not feeling good to my family, my children, and stuff like that. I found my state, I found myself in a state of really despair, feel in a state of hopelessness. Um, and I ended up going to, to segregation, man. And I'm sitting down there in a slam cell, I'm sitting down there. And I'm thinking about committing suicide because I mean I don't want to live this life no more. I feel like I'm burdened on my peoples. Um, you know, I'm tired of living life. I'm just I just just fed up. I I I really lost the, the fight to live. I fought I lost the fight to live, man. I didn't want to do it anymore. And so while I'm sitting there in my cell, I'm thinking about how I how I commit my how I commit suicide. And no stuff, like we are talking right now, like we're talking. I hear a voice say, try me again, right? And I, I, know I'm, I know I'm not crazy, but I know I heard this voice. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I yeah, know I heard yeah, this voice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, try me again. And so, and so now when you go to the hole, you go to segregation, like, you know, so they just throw all your stuff in the box and throw it in your room. And so I just happened to look over where my properties in, in this one little box, whatnot. 
and uh, in my Bible sitting on top, man. And I picked it up, you know what? And I opened it and came on Matthew eleven twenty eight to thirty. He says, come to me, all you labor and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, right? And you find, and you find rest for your soul. For my, um, for my yoke is easy, for my burden light, right? And so when I read that verse, he's like, come to me, all your labor and heavy laden. I'm like, I was in turmoil. And at that, and at that point, yeah. I, wrote a, I wrote a poem that went like mass confusion better than my soul. My thoughts are twisted and out of control. That's how my life was. Mass confusion was better than my soul. My thoughts were twisted and out of control. It got to be the point where I wanted to commit suicide. And so when I was at that moment, he came into my life and he said, try me one more time. And so, uh, and so I, I realized where I was at. I realized everything I was doing my own way in that, in that shape, and form, and fashion, uh, it led me to the point where I wanted to commit suicide. And I know I heard this voice. Nobody else in this room was. I was very anti-social to begin with. And he said, try me one more time. And I pick up this Bible, see this verse, and I know it's him. And so that put, put me on a pathway to enter into his goodness. It's crazy because uh, going to him, I began to read his word. I find the comfort in his word and stuff like that. But when I got out of it, like the whole world is collapsed. It's like being beat up again, right? And it wasn't until that second part of the verse he says, he says, "Learn of me." He said, "Learn of me," right? He said, "You say he said you will find rest for yourself." He said, "You will find rest." And so it wasn't until I began to learn about who truly who God is who Jesus is, I begin to really understand not who he is, but more, but who I am in him. And so the more I, I connected with him, the more he began to reshape me. I can go back and instance in my life where God has still my life. I can see his goodness in my life, even way back then. So he, here's like a little short clip, right? So I'm like 16, right? And, uh, and yeah. like I said, with hood dude do hood thing. So we had a, like a war, all out war, all summer long. You know, we one gang against another. We shooting each other up all day, every day, right? Matter of fact, it was, I was seventeen, right around my brother died, passed away, and um, we shooting each other up. We go on next fight and they shoot them. They come around and they shoot us up, right? And so one day, it's like after my brother was it's like probably me like three or four days after my brother was killed, right? I'm outside busting a serve. Laying up, um, busting a serve or talking to some chick, one, one or two, probably talking to some chick. Um, yeah, I'm talking to a, one of my little girlfriends. So I'm leaning on her car, right? And, uh, and I'm talking to her. I see the blue car kind of behind me. And I'm thinking it's just a smoker, you know, you know, looking for a serve, but I ain't paying no attention. So I'm just keep on talking to her. But I see him speed off, right? And so I never thought nothing else about it, right? Now, fast forward. 10 years. No, I say no, 95, 96. Fast forward like four or five years, right? So I'll say 97. So I'm in El Dorado Correctional Facility, right? I'm there with one of the dudes I used to be gang banging against. And we work in the kitchen. He's like, hey, boy, you should be dead right now, right? I said, what you talking about? And he run down to me the very same day I was leaning over talking to this chick. He said, I pulled up right behind you. I could have gunned you down right then and there. You know what I'm saying? We've been worn all summer long. I could have killed you right on spot. And uh, he said, you know why I didn't kill you? Uh, he's like, I was like, What's, why? He said, because I remember when I was like 13 years old, your dad brought me some candy when I was, cause I was stealing. He brought me some candy and told me, don't be stealing no more. He said, right when I about to gun you down, that memory came my mind out of nowhere. I'm like, thank you, God. Right? That's wild. I'm like, thank you, God. See, God spared my life. I'm talking about 15, 16 years well beforehand, because he knew it was going to be a day that would come to him. He spared my life, right? In the midst of all the chaos that we lived in at a particular point in time, man. I got like many stories like that. You know what I'm saying? Many stories. Yeah. Uh, but, um, 
but that's just a, just a glance, man. This, this, I can go on for days and days and days um, yeah. about just experience his goodness, man, about how. But now I know without a shadow of doubt he loves me, man, because I know his word is true. I know that the doors he's opened, the people who he brought into my life, and uh, just the comfort, the peace that comes with knowing him and believing and trusting in him. You know what I'm saying? So uh, I most definitely know, man. So, yeah. So you can just say just from the, the experiences you've had, God sparing your life, and uh, you just you see his goodness, just his hand of protection upon your life. The whole entire time, and yeah, that's that's an amazing story, man. So, based off like your childhood, man, what you went through, like if there was a kid out there that was listening to this right now that went through that type of childhood, that type of gang life, those type of experiences, just a, a man, a broken household, a, a broken neighborhood, man, what would you say to them? So I would say this, because like I said, I can see many times when God was really involved in my life way back then, right? How he used people, places, and things, right? Um, because in the midst of all that chaos, you see, God was bringing man into my life to pull me out of that, right? Rather than rather than football, rather than boxing, rather than like so many things, right? So I was super smart. People would know this, right? You know what I'm saying? Um, but people, he literally brought people into my life to bring me out that setting, but I chose the hood over that, right? And so, so I would say to young men today that sometimes we don't see God in a, in, in people who he brings to our lives, right? We take them just for face value, right? But God is in the midst of every single thing, every single aspect of our lives, even in the muckery, dirt, and clay, man, he's there, man. And so sometimes it's really taking that leap of faith, distrusting that this person has my best interests at heart, that he don't want to see me go down the wrong path, right? So I can tell somebody all day about God. I can tell all day about Jesus, but when it comes to their living reality, that's not something they really going to see. So I really had to break it down to the point that, hey, man, when you see someone who has your best interests at heart, man, don't turn that way. Don't turn, don't, don't, don't turn your nose, don't snub that because that best interest at heart that they have for them, that's God through and through. You know what I'm saying? So that's what I would say. Yeah, yeah that's a, that's a, <laughs> That's a really strong word, man, just to never turn down your nose or turn up your nose to, to anything or anybody that God's bringing in your path. Uh, man, that's that's great. So the people who have been listening, man, we really appreciate you guys listening to our, our stories, and, and we're really hoping that you guys uh, get to really question God that uh, these stories might reconsider your stance on the goodness of God. And In the next podcast, man, we hope to share more stories of evil and good but of triumph in the end and, and we really hope that you listen in and so uh please join us on this next time on the ground railroad where we talk to more people and uh and get their stories of uh god's goodness thanks for joining us yeah absolutely also i would say too if you got any questions you got any questions you want to hit us up you know we more than willing to answer them uh we want to be really interactive man, because we want you to know that god is real and he does love peace out and we really hope that you will join us as we continue to listen to each other's stories on the Underground Railroad. Thanks for showing up.